This sermon is brought to you by Bloomfield Presbyterian Church, Belfast. To know Jesus and share his love. So our first reading tonight is from John chapter 12, verses 37 to 41. And that's on page 1080 in your pew Bibles. And the subtitle in the NIV version is Belief and Unbelief Among the Jews. Even after Jesus had performed so many signs in their presence, they still would not believe in him. This was to fulfill the word of Isaiah the prophet. Lord, who has believed our message, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For this reason they could not believe, because, as Isaiah says elsewhere, he has blinded their hearts, sorry, he has blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts, so they can neither see with their eyes, nor understand with their hearts, nor turn, and I would heal them. Jesus said this because he saw, sorry again, Isaiah said he saw Jesus' glory and spoke about him. Amen. Isaiah 6, let's start reading from verse 1. In the year that King Isaiah died, I saw the Lord, high and exalted, seated on a throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphim, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces, with two they covered their feet, and with two they were flying And they were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. At the sound of their voices, the doorposts and the thresholds shook and the temple was filled with smoke. Woe to me, I cried. I'm ruined, for I'm a man of unclean lips and I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Then one of the seraphim flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongs from the altar. With it he touched my mouth and said, See, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? And who will go for us? And I said, here am I, send me. He said, go and tell this people, be ever hearing, but never understanding. Be ever seeing, but never perceiving. Make the heart of this people callous. Make their ears dull and close their eyes. Otherwise they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts and turn and be healed. Then I said, how long, Lord? And he answered, until the cities lie ruined and without inhabitant, until the houses are left deserted and the fields ruined and ravaged, until the Lord has sent everyone far away and the land is utterly forsaken. And though a tenth remains in the land, it will again be laid waste. But as the terebinth and oak leave stumps when they're cut down, so the holy seed will be the stump in the land. Please keep that open in front of you. Let's pray and ask for the Lord's help as we come to his word. Sovereign Lord God, we thank you for your presence here with us. Lord, we thank you for the privilege of having your word open in front of us to see what's there, And Lord, our our prayer this evening is that you would be moving amongst us by your Holy Spirit, that you would be taking your word and making it live in our lives, 
Lord, that you would be speaking and helping and shaping us into the people we need to be. Lord, we look to you. We cry out to you in Jesus' name. Amen. One weekend, a number of years ago, our family was at a shopping centre in Vintuk in Namibia, where we lived at the time. And it was there we had a surprise encounter. There weren't many people in the shop we were in that day, um, but we noticed another man walking around the shop, browsing the store, wearing a leather jacket. And then we noticed that A few metres away was a security detail. It turns out that President Hage Heinhob, I think we've got a photo of him coming up on the screen, the president of Namibia, likes to go shopping. Now, uh, his security wouldn't let me anywhere near him, but our two younger children were allowed to go and speak to him. And he very kindly took a few minutes to, to talk with them, uh, and it was a really memorable day for us. I mean, we'd, we'd never met a president before. Now, maybe that doesn't impress you much. Maybe you're used to meeting famous people. But look, imagine this. Imagine that you got to meet the king, King Charles III. Imagine getting an invitation to Buckingham Palace. Or imagine being invited to visit the the President of the United States at the White House. Imagine being there with the President in the Oval Office. That would be a story to tell the grandchildren, wouldn't it? But imagine this. You meet the Lord. The Lord. The the King over every king over every president. Imagine seeing his glory. Imagine being overwhelmed by his holiness. Imagine seeing him seated on his heavenly throne. Imagine seeing his his heavenly entourage. Imagine having a conversation with him. Imagine being commissioned by this God who rules over all to bring a message to his people. Well, that's what happens to Isaiah on this day. This wasn't just a a day that Isaiah would never forget. It would quite literally change the course of his life. Isaiah chapter 6 shows us where Isaiah begins, how he became a prophet to the people of Judah. Now you'll notice that the chapter divides neatly into two halves. First of all, in verses 1 to 7, we have Isaiah's vision of the Lord. Isaiah's vision of the Lord. And then in the second half, we have Isaiah's commission from the Lord in verses 8 to 13. Isaiah's vision, Isaiah's commission. So notice here that Isaiah here sees the Lord. Well, let's look at the chapter in a bit more detail. First of all, Isaiah's vision in verses 1 to 7. Isaiah's vision. Isaiah has a vision of the holy and glorious God. And the the first verse locates the time and the place of that vision, as well as summarising its content. Look at verse 1. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord, high and exalted, seated on a throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Now, King Uzziah died in about 740 BC. Uzziah, or Azariah, as he was also known, began his reign at the age of 16. And in total, he reigned for 52 years over Judah. In many ways, he was a good king. 
although he didn't remove the, the pagan shrines from the land, he seemed to start well. His policies brought peace and stability to Judah. But then it seems that power went to his head and he grew proud. Although he started well, he didn't finish well. In fact, he died in disgrace. He unlawfully took the role of a priest and entered the holy place of the temple and started burning incense there. As he was being challenged by the priests, his skin broke out with leprosy. And from that day until the day he died, he lived in isolation, away from the people and unable to rule over them. But it's now the year of Isaiah's death when Isaiah sees the Lord in the temple in Jerusalem. And look at how God is described here. He, he's above all powers. He's sovereignly in control of everything. He's seated on his throne. And his royal robe fills Isaiah's vision because it fills the temple. Notice that God is described here in relation to his throne and his robe and his exalted position, but there's no attempt made to describe God himself. In verse 2, we're introduced to the seraphim, or more literally, the burning ones. In the ancient world, kings were sometimes depicted being guarded by a, a pair of uh, burning winged servants. That's what we see here. We're told that each seraph had six wings. Two covered their faces, showing that they, that they couldn't look at a holy God. With two wings, their feet were covered, probably uh, showing modesty. And with two wings, they flew. And they were calling out to one another, verse 3, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. The first thing that confronts Isaiah is the holiness of God, repeated three times for emphasis. He's not just holy, he's three times holy. He's the holiest of the holy. He's a God of absolute moral purity. He's very different to Uzziah, the proud king of Judah. He's very different to us. Uh, the, the other attribute of God that's chorused by the seraphim is his glory, which fills not just the temple, we're told, but the whole earth. His heavenly holiness is revealed in earthly glory. The whole of creation, the whole earth, declares the glory of its creator. And as the seraphim call to one another, verse 4, their, their words shake the doorposts and the thresholds as if warning Isaiah not to come any closer, not to attempt to cross the entranceway into God's holy presence. The, the temple was filled with smoke so as to obscure Isaiah's vision of this awesome God. And Isaiah cries, verse 5, Woe to me! I'm ruined, he says, for I'm a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Now, although the Lord has been described as a king in these verses already, this is the first time he's actually given that title. King Uzziah's kingship was a pale reflection of the true king of all. 
And to suggest that Isaiah is petrified by being in the presence of God is to put it mildly. In fact, he he thinks it's all over. He thinks he's going to be destroyed. See, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure that we really feel the shock value of these words, that Isaiah's eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Do you remember that God tells Moses on Mount Sinai in Exodus 33 verse 20 that he he couldn't see his face and live? And so the, the, the pressing question here then is, how will Isaiah survive this encounter? As King Uzziah discovered at great personal cost, you can't just breeze into the presence of the holy God. Isaiah recognises that he's in grave danger because he, a sinner, is in the presence of a holy God. And in particular, he's aware of his filthy lips and that he belongs to a people of filthy lips. Over in Luke chapter 6, verse 45, Jesus reminds us that our mouths speak what our hearts are full of. Our mouths are an indicator of what's going on in our hearts. It's actually an important way for Christians to gauge their spiritual lives. What dominates your conversation? What what, what do you speak about? Do you speak often about God and his love? Do you use your words to build others up or tear people down? Are you known for your angry words? Your judgmental words? Your harsh words, your bitter words, your crude words. Well, it's Isaiah's unclean lips that he becomes aware of in God's holy presence. The thing he notices about himself is just how grubby his life really is. Now, I I want to suggest to you that the same is true in our Christian lives. The more clearly we see God, the more we'll be aware of our own sinfulness. Christian maturity brings not only a clearer vision of who God is, but also a clearer vision of who we are. We realise that that God is Lord. Lord. And we're not. That God is holy. And we're not. That God is glorious. And we're not. As we walk further into the light, God will reveal more of the dark recesses of our hearts. You know, we often try to kid ourselves, don't we, that we're good people. But as we grow in our understanding about God, we're we're forced to realise that we're worse than we thought we were. That our personal standards of what constitutes what's right are far too low when compared to the standards of a holy God. You see, it's, it's not just in one or two areas of my life that sin has affected. It's everywhere. My thoughts, my attitudes, my actions. It's everywhere. And, And we would quickly despair about how thoroughly sinful our lives are except for the amazing grace of God the one who's at work within us by his spirit, clearing out the rubbish of sin day by day. 
but more than that, the one who's provided a way for our sin to be atoned for. There's a wonderful line in C.S. Lewis's book, The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe. One of the children who goes uh, to Narnia through the wardrobe asks if Aslan the lion is safe to be near. In the stories, Aslan represents Jesus. And this is the reply. Safe? Who said anything about safe? Of course he isn't safe. But he's good. And that's what we see here. Isaiah realizes that he's not safe in God's holy presence because of his sin. But what we see next highlights God's amazing goodness towards rebellious people. Look at verses 6 and 7. Then one of the seraphim flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongs from the altar. With it, he touched my mouth and said, See, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. So from the altar, from the place of blood sacrifice, one of the seraphim takes a live coal and applies it to Isaiah's lips. His unclean lips are purged by fire. And as he does so, the seraphim declares that the guilt of his lips is taken away and his sin atoned for. Isaiah's sin, more literally, has been covered in the way that someone might cover a debt on our behalf. The price was paid for his sin. Now, as Christians under a new covenant, we look to another place of sacrifice for our atonement. It's not a burning coal that removes the guilt of our sin. It's a dying saviour. The source of our forgiveness is not an animal sacrifice on an altar, but the sacrifice of God's own dear Son on the cross. And that's what we remember every time we come to the communion table. That's what we remember every Easter. The full and final atonement for sin that's available through the cross of Jesus to all who put their faith in him. Which brings us to the second half of this chapter. Having been cleaned up for God's presence, Isaiah is now commissioned for God's service. This is where we see Isaiah's commission in verses 8 to 13. Just a few times in our married life, Kathy has had to take a trip away from home and I've found myself looking after the children on my own. Now generally, generally, that went okay, apart from one thing. After washing and drying the clothes, how are you meant to know which clothes go in which wardrobe? I'm really bad at it. A number of times I had the children come to me with a piece of clothing in their hands and a look of utter disbelief on their faces as they discovered clothes in their rooms that, that didn't belong to them. See, for me, getting the right clothes in the right place was a tough assignment and it left my children longing for the return of their mother. Well, Isaiah is given a tough assignment, isn't he, here, that makes my clothes problem seem extremely insignificant. He, he's commissioned to bring God's words to people who don't want to hear what he's got to say and who are going to reject his message. Now, this part of the chapter can be summed up 
by two questions. The first is God's question. The second, Isaiah's. First then, verses 8 to 10. Whom shall I send? Look at verse 8. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? And who will go for us? And I said, Here am I, send me. He said, Go and tell this people, be ever hearing, but never understanding, be ever seeing, but never perceiving. Make the heart of this people calloused, make their ears dull and close their eyes. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts, and turn and be healed. Now, it's not clear who the us refers to in verse 8. It may refer to God's heavenly counsel, or it may be another one of those Old Testament hints of the doctrine of the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But what is clear is that the Lord asks who should be sent as his representative to the people of Judah. And Isaiah responds, send me. Having been overwhelmed by his own sinfulness, but then restored by God's grace, he's ready for God's service. And so he volunteers to be God's mouthpiece. But I wonder how he felt after he was told what his job description would be, what his ministry would be like. Because these verses show us that following God is far from easy at times. Isaiah's faithful service would be costly service. So what does God call Isaiah to do? Well, his message uh, is to the people of Judah that verse 9, their lack of faith would mean that they would hear but never understand. They would see but never know what was going on. Isaiah would faithfully bring God's message but the people would remain spiritually blind and deaf. With biting sarcasm, God tells Isaiah verse 10 to, to harden their hearts and block up their ears and close their eyes through his preaching. Otherwise they might see and hear and understand and turn back to God and be healed. But they didn't want to turn back to God. The people of Judah would remain hardened by sin and unbelief and unmoved by Isaiah's message. Which brings us to the final question of the chapter, verses 11 to 13. How long, Lord? How long? Look at verse 11. Then I said, how long, Lord? And he answered, until the cities lie ruined and without inhabitant, until the houses are left deserted and the fields ruined and ravaged, until the Lord has sent everyone far away and the land is utterly forsaken. And although a tenth remains in the land, it will again be laid waste. But as the terebinth and oak leave stumps when they're cut down, so the holy seed will be the stump in the land. Okay, it, it's, a, it's a tough assignment, says Isaiah. But how long will the people be unresponsive like this? I, I mean, how long do I need to wait? I, I could tough it out for 10 years, m maybe 20 years if there was going to be revival after that. But God says there would be no revival in his lifetime. People would continue in their sins. Things would end in the near destruction of the people of Judah in punishment because of their sin, verse 13, only a remnant would survive. They would be faced with punishment. There would only be a stump that would be left. Now we must realise that sometimes that's what God calls his people to. 
we, we faithfully hold out the gospel of Jesus to others, but we don't see large numbers of people turning to Christ. We don't see the revival we'd hoped for. It may be that faithfulness to Jesus will result in small returns for us and little spiritual fruit in our generation. But, you know, it's so important for us to realise that God isn't just the God of our generation. He's the God of history. History itself is in his hands. You see, in time, the people of Judah would be overwhelmed by the might of the Babylonians because of their sin. But as the end of this chapter makes clear, things weren't over for God's people. God had a plan, a plan that continued unwaveringly throughout the generations. A few pages on, in Isaiah chapter 11, verse 1, Isaiah tells us about a shoot that would come from the stump of David's family. That, that there's a promise here of one who would come to rescue his people from their sins once and for all. Another king like David. In other words, it's the promise of the Messiah. One who would come filled with God's spirit. One who would delight in doing God's will, just as the people of Judah were meant to do. You see, Isaiah wouldn't see this prophecy come true in his own day, in his own life. His ministry would be a long, hard slog. His ministry would largely be for the benefit of those who came after him, people like us. It would be over 700 years before the Messiah came. But you see, in God's good time, this spirit-filled king did come to deal finally with our deepest problems, the curse of sin and death in our lives. And did you know we're fortunate enough to know something that Isaiah didn't know? His name, Jesus. Thank you for listening to Bloomfield Presbyterian Church Sermon Audio. We're a congregation in East Belfast with worship services at 11am and 7pm every Sunday. For more information, visit bloomfieldpresbyterian.org.